Hi, I'm Phil Asmussen. Welcome to Deloitte's TMT 2011 Predictions. We're here today to talk about the telecommunications sector, and I'm joined this morning by uh, Duncan Stewart and Paul Lee. Uh, gentlemen, can we jump right in? Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Um, you know, there's a number of predictions out there, and there's so much going on in telecom today, but one thing that came out loud and clear was a lot of pieces on Wi-Fi. Why Wi-Fi? Well, the thing about Wi-Fi, and it's been around there for a long time, uh, as been saying, is the standard which has been sort of steadily improving for a number of years. Uh, but there are some changes which are happening which make Wi-Fi become a lot more important and um, are making to the general consumer as well as the business user a lot more aware of them. So there is a the fact that we've got caps on usage which are coming in, which are constraining the amount we can use cellular for. There's also the availability of Wi-Fi. There's probably going to be about a billion units of technology shipping with, with Wi-Fi connectivity uh, next year. And also the ease of use um, for Wi-Fi is becoming uh, a lot better, both, both in terms of the ability to switch to Wi-Fi and the availability of Wi-Fi hotspots, uh, as well as Wi-Fi in the home and in the, in, in the business too. And some of it's just consumer awareness. I know a number of people with smartphones who kind of read about something in the paper or they see a friend and they go, hey, how long has my phone had Wi-Fi and I didn't know? And so some of it's just even a change of usage. We're, we're recognizing it's important. One of the other ones is that on a number of devices, many of the devices are becoming much more network aware. Uh, so often on a tablet, uh, I have actually been told, um, yeah, you can do this over cellular frequencies, but we, we wouldn't advise it. Why don't you wait until you're in a Wi-Fi area so that maybe for either uh, bandwidth reasons or speed reasons or cost reasons, I might want to use Wi-Fi. Well, there's no question data is increasing in the mobile world incredibly, and, and we've, we, we've seen what's happened over the last number of years as some carriers have experienced 5,000% uh, increases over a relatively short period of time. A lot of that is being driven by these new devices that are out there, the tablets, the smartphones. Uh, and, and it seems that consumers are gravitating towards that. Um, now, when you get to a Wi-Fi perspective, give, give me a little perspective because one of the other uh, predictions we have also deals with 4G and the uptake rate of 4G. And in that prediction, one of the things that is brought out is that Wi-Fi may actually have a little bit of a dampening of a need for 4G out there. While at the same time, it actually helps uh, in our prediction uh, it also helps some of the economics of going to, to a 4G site. Help, help explain that a little bit if you could. Well, you know, when we look at what's happening with mobile devices and consumption in general, um, a lot of what's really pushing bandwidth demand is, is video. Uh, that is the sort of core reason why uh, our need for it is, is going up by so much. And there's one example which is often given by one of the CTOs, one of the uh, carriers in the UK, and he compares uh, a video um, uh, specified for mobile consumption. You're saying, you know, that video, two minutes, that's equivalent to 500,000 text messages. So that's a perspective uh, that, that we have there. And the thing is, people want to keep on using more and more video. You know, we enjoy video, streaming video. But we don't have to always use the same technology to deliver that. So we can use Wi-Fi um, for that. And that can take off a lot of the demand, um, which, was, which we have been seeing over cellular networks. Well, let me ask you a question. One of the things that uh, you find when you go and you talk to a mobile carrier about Wi-Fi is it's, you know, back devil, back. I mean, why would you bring this thing up? And, and uh, yet reality is a lot of what we, we say or what, what we predict is that there's going to be a lot of synergies that can be created out of that, and it shouldn't necessarily be looked at as a threat but an opportunity. Um, where do they see the threats? I mean, one of the things I always wonder about when I think of Wi-Fi, I often think of free Wi-Fi spots in a coffee shop, unlimited use. Uh, it's, it's easy to get onto. Uh, nobody's checking me. I'm not getting a bill. I don't have to be a subscriber. Where, where in the mobile world, because of data uptake rates and the like, we're starting to see us go from a, from, you know, you know, away from an all-you-can-eat world and into a tiered world of data. Is that where some of the pain points are? How will that potentially work as I try to navigate as a consumer between uh, either a 3G or a 4G network right down to my Wi-Fi? And there's a big challenge mm -hmm. implicit in that. If you don't make Wi-Fi pretty much easy to sign on to, pretty much, maybe not free, but, but certainly an awful lot of data for not a very lot of money. If you don't do that, then you don't encourage people to offload off the cellular frequencies where spectrum is much more limited and where we're running into congestion. So trying to pay, get people to pay the same amount per bit on Wi-Fi as they do on the cellular ones is a business model that's going to not accomplish what it is the carriers want to. 
And I think in terms of you know, what is a carrier, uh, and to your point, you know, there's been an association of almost like a, mm. a link in between. A carrier has to be cellular. And to your point, it's not just the only option there. So in terms of what a carrier does, I think uh, over time its motivation will be to be the network provider. And it will determine what's best for which application, for which context. And if, and if it sorts out that complexity and makes it simple and easy to use and powerful to use with the consumer, then they're in a good position. Uh, but if they just, I think, align to one technology, then uh, in many markets that may be a challenge. Let's make a shift to 4G for a moment. Um, you know, a lot of carriers here in the United States are uh, now, now looking at um, uh, some major rollout of 4G, and, and we've seen a number of carriers doing that. Some of them are going to be rolling those out literally over the next few days in, in multiple mm -hmm. markets. Um, any type of technology transition from generation to generation costs a tremendous amount of money. And so there has to be the value proposition there for the carrier. And I think in this case, um, uh, what I'd like to hear from the two of you is why? Why now? Why 4G? I understand we want to talk a little bit about why it may not go as quickly as we think. But what is 4G going to offer the consumer uh, tomorrow that uh, 3G did not? At the level of the consumer, it's actually not that profound a shift. The latest, greatest, cutting edge 3.5G technology, HSP Plus it's called, actually offers quite good speeds, but at a cost. Um, there's certain things spectrum. you can't do as well. Spectrum. Mm -hmm. always, if we say spectrum one more time, we're in trouble. But that's what the story is. If you are in a network where spectrum is tight, where you've got a lot of users, where you've got a lot of congestion, some of the advantages that LTE offer is pretty enormous. So that's the why LTE in 2011. If, on the other hand, you're in an area where congestion is not as bad, or you have, for whatever reason, an absolute bucket of spectrum, you don't need to worry about it. And maybe you can defer that spending. But uh, one of the things is, nowhere in the world is congestion going down. Nowhere in the world is mobile data going down. So we see 4G and LTE and WiMAX rolling out it may take a couple of years longer, but it will become a necessity pretty much everywhere by 2015. 2015. So that's what we should be looking for. All that money has to be spent by 2015. Between now and 2015. Okay, great. Um, shift again a little bit. Uh, it was really funny because I read one of our predictions and, uh, uh, you know, I just happened to be having a conversation the other day with our retail sector leader and her concern uh, was really around Wi-Fi in the retail store. and. Um, uh, you know, this is kind of a scary thing, but it's also a great example of where a technology that can be seen as a threat really has the potential to be a huge opportunity. Talk a little bit about our prediction of why we think we're going to see more and more Wi-Fi set up in the retail establishments uh, over the next year. So it's that devil, get behind me devil. Two years ago, retailers viewed Wi-Fi in the store as, well, while I'm at it, why don't, why don't I let my competitors set up a stand inside my store so that they can really comparison shop? And that was, that was a common belief, that if, if you gave them Wi-Fi, they would comparison shop either with the competing store or with the internet. Go, go, get, go buy it online. The reality is that isn't what happens. People go out there, and when they comparison shop these days, more often than not, they go, oh, it's the same price, or maybe it's a dollar or two cheaper, but I'm here. I'm here now. I want it now. And what it did when you put Wi-Fi in a store is it removes that barrier, because the problem wasn't that we thought it was cheaper somewhere else. It was that we were afraid it was cheaper we somewhere else. We didn't know. Once you remove that uncertainty, all of a sudden people are taking their wallets out, and they're buying it then and there. And so retailers are going from this was the enemy to this is something that not only removes the uncertainty, it allows me to do all kinds of other stuff. If I'm in a store, I can now have consumers using their tablets to find out what aisle is this on? Are we out of stock? Do you have it in blue? Freeing up sales staff for other more productive applications. In-store catalogs supported by Wi-Fi. Maybe even more interactive applications. A lot of potential drivers to the retail business become enabled with this new technology. What about privacy and security uh, uh, concerns? I mean, I mean, I mean, the real interesting thing around this, and in my conversation with our retail sector leader, um, I made an analogy to so many things that are digital. You know, whether you're in the you know the print business and having to deal with going to a digital format from your analog format, and not really liking, it's very uncomfortable to make that switch. I think retailers had the same thing. They saw, as you said, Duncan, this this this. My God, I've opened the kimono and I've I've brought my competitors into my physical store presence, as opposed to thinking about, hey, what am I going to be able to push 
to the customer? What am I going to be able to learn about the customer? How am I going to be able to track patterns in the office? All of a sudden, you can start to see that might get a little bit towards that line where regulators may get a little concerned about security and privacy of the individuals. Any, any thoughts that how that might be addressed or how it might either hinder or accelerate Wi-Fi and retail? What we're expecting in 2011 as in 2010, privacy will remain a big concern for regulators and also for people in the industry. Um, and there's lots of um, discussions going on as to exactly how to uh, address that. Uh, but the reality is you know, we've always been offering information about ourselves um, to bricks and mortar stores. Um, and there are already quite strong data protection laws which are in place. And what we'd expect to see overall in terms of uh, privacy is that there will be sort of um, slightly more controls uh, put in place, but generally in terms of sharing information, we will still be doing that. Now, one of the other predictions is out there that uh, I, I find interesting because I've, I've, I've worked around it is video conferencing. And uh, I've, I've been, because of client commitments, uh, an early adopter of video conferencing. I've seen how we can make it, it work in our own business, and reduce some of our travel, and yet still get that you know, presence feel uh, in, in faraway countries uh, and, and be more efficient in delivering the goods that we need to deliver. Um, in our prediction, we really talk about the fact that video conferencing, although it is coming down uh, quite rapidly in price, it still will likely have a slower uptake rate both on the enterprise side and the consumer side. Give, give us a little bit of an insight as to, as to some of the factors that are going to result in that slower uptake. I mean, what we're expecting uh, for next year, well, for 2011, is that there'll be a lot of devices available which can support video conferencing. So at least 400 million devices will be shipped uh, this year, which allow you to do some, fu uh, some form of uh, so, video calling. So that's a frontal camera type of? A frontal camera you know, in tablets you know, or in smartphones. Those are the two big areas. And also, um, the high-end video conferencing is becoming a lot cheaper. It's coming into television sets. Um, so the price point's getting a lot more attractive. Um, but there are several things around the business meeting or around the personal meeting which we just can't overlook, so behavioral aspects. Uh, and what we tend to observe is that you know, if you think about a meeting, it's not just about what happens in the boardroom which matters, it's what happens around the, the boardroom before that meeting and after that meeting, where you'd really make that contact. Um, what so, happens in the bar? For example, on the <laughs> golf course or wherever. Yeah. Um, and so video conferencing can't yet replicate that. And then for any other sort of S uh, standard conversation, then a phone call is good enough. Um, and for people, you know, um, it still is a case that a lot of people just aren't happy, aren't familiar, aren't comfortable with being on camera. You know, and every one of these predictions we've talked about, and, and, and yes, they're related in the mobile world, and certainly in teleconferencing, there's a mobile mm -hmm. aspect to that too. But in every single one of those, one of the things that was touched on was the device. Mm -hmm. Device capabilities, uh, you know, putting frontal cameras out there, shipping X number of units, you know, smartphone sales going up, all of these things that kind of drive data, drive video, drive, uh, you know, data demand, um, you know, the different uses of data out there. How big an impact across all of our predictions is the device going to have? I think one thing about proliferation of devices is it's great news for the network operators because. Now, one of the things which has been a frustration, I think, for some of the operators which have been offering very high-speed services is that there aren't actually that many applications which, on their own, require 100 megabits per second, apart from some forms of probably quite illegal activity. But if you have, in a household, a dozen devices, all of which are sipping connectivity, all of which require connectivity to work, uh, then sort of collectively you've got a big gulp, and so you can justify charging that premium for a 50 megs connection, 100 megs, or 300 meg connection. So you know, overall, I think it's good news for the connectivity providers. So when you look at the explosion of devices, which you've talked about, one of the concerns that you hear people talk about now is we've got sub subscription fatigue. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to, all because I have 12 devices doesn't mean I want 12 subscriptions. Do you see that? Do you, do you see the Wi-Fi and the, and, and the 4G and all of these technologies? Is that going to be fixed in this? I think what's fascinating is in terms of the uh, subscription uh, issue, you've got sort of some interesting bundle, bundles coming out. And uh, you're seeing in, already in the US and potentially in the UK, cable um, operators offering Wi-Fi in public areas as a means of uh, retaining customers, as a means of, um, say, reducing the, the, the churn. Um, and so, in a sense, you know, that reduces um, two sets of subscriptions uh, to one. But it's not necessarily the logical or classical Connectivity, uh, connection you would have seen, so between cellular uh, and Wi-Fi. 
But uh, I'd expect you know, we always see a contraction of office, and then we always see a, um, a growth of office, and that will probably be cyclical right. for some time. So here's a final question. We've got these predictions out there. They're, they're fascinating. The world is moving very quickly. If you had to say, what is the greatest opportunity that's presented by those predictions, and what's the greatest concern that might be presented by those predictions, what would it be? Um, if I could just focus on opportunities, um, you know, connectivity is a fantastic enabler. Uh, you need it to make so many technology things, so many media things, uh, so many things happening in other um, sectors uh, just work. And the challenge with that, though, is that you've got this complexity around it. And the opportunity for the carriers is really trying to simplify that complexity before it gets to the consumers or the business users. If you can solve that, you provide a lot of value. And I'd say the biggest concern is, is matching your capacity with consumer demand. And it isn't an easy question. I can think in the last decade, we have seen situations where carriers have gone out there and built ultra high capacity networks all around the world, only to have to wait eight years before those networks even hit 10% utilization. Similarly, as we're seeing right now, the whole debate versus three and a half G, should I go LTE? The, the real challenge is, do I, if I, if I don't spend the money now, having a whole bunch of customers leaving me because I can't give them what it is they want is another enormous peril. So balancing overbuild versus underbuild is, I think, in 2011, the single biggest dilemma for any carrier anywhere in the world. Well, thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. We'll see how 2011 does unfold. But uh, Duncan and Paul, I want to I wanna thank you for all your work and appreciate uh, your 2011 predictions. Thank you. Thank you, Phil.